Todd Hood, Kale Beverly, sir. How you doing? Very good. How you doing, sir? Thank you for taking the call. Man, I appreciate it, man. Anytime we can talk about the Word of God, it's it's a blessing, man. So, like I said, I just like to record my conversation whenever I talk about the Bible. I learn from them, and other people can too. So that's all. Sounds great. Okay, cool. Yeah, man. I like your voice. I told you that before. You got the voice of radio. <laughs> But uh, it makes one to no one. <laughs> yeah, appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, so you were you were asking some good questions in terms of because you know a lot of people ask those questions. A lot of atheists kind of ask those questions, trying to figure out, um, I guess uh, the the uh, the essence of of who God is and how can He operate in evil and in good. Well, um, the the reality of it is that uh, God tells us that <clears throat> He created evil. And God also created good. Does that make sense? He's created everything, so yes, it does. Yeah. So if he's if he's created it, then he's in control of it. So God is the one that kills, and God is the one to, that heals. God is the one that uh, tears down, and God is the one that lifts up. He's from all promotions come from 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 God. So once we know who this, who our basis of, of existence and everything comes from, now we can get an understanding. All right, so why does God kill? See, and why does he, you know, uh, bring life? Well, well, actually, it was less of that because, I mean, we all uh, are going to be born and die. So, and, and I believe that that is all in God's hands. So it's less about God, why does God do things, but it was more of in Joshua. Yeah. Um, what is, uh, what's the rationale for God commanding uh, the Israelites to kill uh, people that are one that they don't know that just happened to be living in a particular zip code so they could take their land and not even use it if you will but to burn it and burn it to the ground destroy it to the ground and not to settle there because uh, that land is not to be settled okay I like to just look at the word and let it speak to us because um, I can go with all my theology, but it all it all matters what God is saying, um, why he commanded man to do that. Um, you know, that land is his promised land. He promised it to Abraham and he promised it to his his seed and his descendants. So if you're if you're in that land and you're not part of his seed, then God has the right to kill that person and take over that land, especially if they won't leave. So, but let's look at it. What what uh, what what verse did you have uh, uh, challenges with in in Joshua? Because Joshua was the one that that brought them into the land. Mo God killed Moses because of sin. Moses never made it to that promised land. God actually took him to the mountain and killed him. So God kills his own. God kills everyone, and God brings life to everyone. But let's look at it in Joshua. What what uh, part in Joshua were you were you challenged with? Okay, uh, let's see, I'm going to go in, it's, I think it might be, let's see here, I'm thinking it's about uh, Joshua 5 or 6 around there, let me see. Okay. Now remember, God even killed the, the Jewish people, he only let them from a certain age go in. Right, to, for all of their um, their descendants uh, through those generations had to die. Okay. Uh, but that's that's different than uh, so. So we're saying killing. Um, but I, I, you know, my uh, my question is more around God doesn't need man to go in and murder each other. Uh, to war with each other. God didn't need the Israelites to go and conquer all these lands. God could have cleared those lands 
for these people to um, to go to or to uh, to obtain the promised land. Oh well, yeah. Well, I, like I mentioned in our email text. God doesn't need anything. He doesn't even need his creation. It's not he didn't create anything out of need. He created it out of love. So God doesn't need anything. That's that's going without say, saying. Um God didn't need to tell Moses to go to Pharaoh. He could have just killed Pharaoh and took his people out of there. But see, God is a God of order. So God put Pharaoh in the power position. So God chose to work through Moses. Moses stuttered and Moses was shocked. He was like, uh, no, I stuttered. Don't you know I stuttered? I can't go tell Pharaoh. Why don't you bring Aaron and tell him to do it? And God said, no, I gave you your tongue. I know that I'm choosing you. See, God didn't need to. God chose to. And God chose to work through Moses to tell Pharaoh to let his people go. Pharaoh had to let his people go. God didn't force Pharaoh's, I mean, God didn't make Pharaoh or kill Pharaoh to let his people go. God forced him to make the decision after sending those plagues to let his people go. See, God works through man. God chooses to work through man when he chooses to. God is a sovereign God. If he chooses not to, he when, when, he, when he warned Abraham of Sodom and Gomorrah, he said, hey, I'm going to I'm going to destroy that land. And he sent his angels to do it. God didn't specifically, uh, you know, uh, you know, his voice from heaven come out. No, he sent his angels to do it. And then fire and brimstone fell from heaven. But uh, God chose at that time not to do it through battle. He chose to do it through his angels. There's going to come a time when God is going to speak in, in uh, you know, at his uh, great second uh, coming. And he's going to have vengeance and he's going to speak and, and, and he's going to kill many people. So God, God chooses many ways is how he likes to, uh, you know, facilitate his order. So God's a God of order. And when he chose to free his people, he chose to do it through Pharaoh's command. Pharaoh had the command to let his people go. And Pharaoh finally did. Well, the same thing with, um, with Joshua and going into the promised land. They were going to win it by conquering that land. People were already living in it. They those were heathen nations. They detest God. They did very wicked things. They, you know, they put their ch children into the fire. They did abortions. They did a lot of evil things before the sight of the Lord. They deserve to die. We all deserve to die. So God chose, he could have just wiped out everybody and just, I mean, of course, God could just, he could just snap his finger or just speak and he had to snap his finger, just speak. And now we're already into the new world, but that's not how he chooses to do things. He's a God of order. And when he puts something in writing or in word, he follows his order. He's, he's commanded by his word. That's why I say, let's go look at the word and what the word has to say about it. So in, in trying to decide, hey, why did God decide this and why did God decide that? He sets his precepts and he sets his his way, his order and way of doing things, you know, based off of his order and how he has it ordained. And he also does it for our purpose. He sent Moses to Pharaoh so Moses can see the power of God. Moses didn't know until he actually walked with God and followed God's commands. And so when Moses dealt with Pharaoh, now he had the confidence to go lead the people in the wilderness. Does it make sense? And so now Joshua was taking over the reins from Moses. Now Joshua's turn was to lead the people. And so let's look at that. So you were saying Joshua 5? I'm looking at it here while you. I'm trying to listen to you. I'm not good at multitasking. Uh -huh. So I'm trying to listen to you and... Uh, find the part where it basically was speaking to um, to overtaking the town and not um, uh, don't build on the town or don't build on that land. 
uh, leave the land and, uh, and nothing shall, shall be built on it unless it shall be cursed. Okay, let me look at that. Okay. And I don't know if it was when they, um, the first, the first town they, uh, they took over where he said, don't build on, don't build anything in this and don't take anything. And then, uh, is it Achen or Aiken? Uh, oh, yeah. took, uh, took thing, took a couple other things for himself and then, uh, brought, uh, Not just shame, but uh, but brought this gain uh, from God onto uh, onto the people. It might be then, Joshua uh, three. Let's and God see. punished them by not letting them uh, succeed against. Uh, I think it was the town of I. All right, that's fine. Um, but then, uh, from my perspective, just in reading it, Joshua was a, uh, the book of Joshua was uh, just a, a big challenge for me. One, because it was so much redundancy. It was uh, basically tell them what you're going to tell them, then you told them, and then you tell them what you told them, and that type of thing. And I'm like, oh, Lord. And then uh, when it gets into the later books, it just becomes a um, a recording of the land and deed, um, you know, like the uh, the county deeds office or something. Yeah. Yeah. Well, see, God, see, and that's what people don't understand. That's why there's a New Testament and an Old Testament. Um, it is God has it, and it and it says in Second Timothy um, um, two fifteen, rightly divide the word of truth. We have to rightly divide it. God has made the division, and we have to rightly divide it. There's really two people groups or three people groups that God is really dealing with in his word. And God has chosen through the children of Israel, which was Jacob. God changed Jacob's name to Israel. So his children to give his word to the world. And so most of the Old Testament is dealing with the children of Israel. So it's very specific to that group of people. Um, so they had specific laws, specific commandments, specific ordinances, uh, rituals, feast days, uh, calendar days, things like that, that God specifically gave to that people group um, for that time period. So dispensation is a biblical word is found four times in the King James Bible. And so that dispensation, which means a time period that God is dealing with the people that um, with his people. And so that dispensation of law was ruled by law and governed by law. So everything had to be done by the book. So God has a purpose for doing for those things and all of those things were to point us and in, 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 in Galatians it tells us I think it's Galatians 3 that all of the law was our schoolmaster to point us to Christ so all of this you know killing and bloodshed this all throughout the Old Testament not just Joshua you continue reading I mean it, it's a vicious book um, and all of that is to point us to you know Without blood, the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. And so the purpose of the killing, whether it's uh, for a whole people group in the land, um, for that land, and maybe he, he had a purpose for that land later on. Um, David was the king of killing. They went around killing. He had too much blood on his hands. That's why he couldn't build the temple. That's why King Solomon was never had war. That's why he was able to build the temple. But it's just it's just there to show us that without blood, the sacrifice of blood, the shed blood, there is no remission of sins. 
but none of that bloodshed could pay for our sins. So that's why it had to point us to Jesus Christ. His pure bloodshed is the only blood that satisfied Christ. And it was shed once. It didn't have to be shed many times. And so once for all, he was the propitiation for all of our sins. All of us that believe on him and also for the world, the heathen, the people that don't believe on him. His blood is good for all of their sins. So it's a bloody book in the Old Testament. The New Testament, for most part, is not as bloody. I mean, you do have the, you know, in, in the Gospels with Jesus going to the, the cross and how they, you know, they beat him. Uh, but most of it up until it talks, you know, in Revelations, it's not as bloody. It's more grace. And that's really more for us. It's the good news of what God has done for us. And he's building his church his spiritual church of believers and we have a special calling and now he's not just talking to the jews he's talking to the jew and the gentile and when we're in christ we're all one in the same it's neither jew nor gentile so the three people groups are the jew of the old testament the church which is consistent of the jew and gentile of the new testament and then the heathen which is the lost person which is which is going to go directly to hell because they've rejected the only grace and gospel message of Jesus Christ for our salvation. So that, those are really the three people groups of, of the Bible. And so what you're reading is not a letter directed towards you. It's a letter directed towards the Jew. And so it's hard for us to really understand because that was over 2,000, 4,000 years ago. Um, and we didn't live in that day and age and it was a little bit it was a lot more bloody we had just to even eat you had to kill your own meat and things like that so we can't it, it's more gory to us than it was someone that actually lived in that day but the reality is to conquer anything you must kill it you must kill and take over and conquer that land and god didn't want any he didn't want his people to be tainted with sin. That's why they had to kill all of the women, the children, everyone. Because a lot of the men, what they would do is when they conquer and they'll take their women as wives. And now when they're doing that, these women, just like King Solomon had 700 women, 300 concubines, and these women turned his heart away from God. And so God knows that. And so God didn't want any of that heathen worship in his... In his um, in, in his uh, Jewish camp. And so it was a rigid, strict, you know, rule. It wasn't grace at that time. It was law. Now we under understand how, um, how cult leaders tell their followers these types of things and then get their followers to, uh, to abide and to comply with them. Oh yeah, well that, that yeah, those are cult leaders, and those are people that uh, that they follow that cult's words. See, we follow the word of God, so that's why I'm saying let's look at the scripture and see what the Bible says. But that again, that was back then. We're under grace. We're not under the law. We don't follow the law anymore. So we follow the grace of of Jesus Christ, and He said those two things: if you love Me with all your heart, or if you love the Lord God with all of your heart, soul, and mind, and if you love your brother or your neighbor um as you love yourself you follow those two things you'll follow all of the law so now we are under the law of love and of grace we don't have to follow all of those ritualistic laws we don't have to sacrifice animals and and, and do certain things so if if we were to be fooled by a cult leader we wouldn't be following the word of of god no i'm sorry uh cult leaders who use the bible who, who they they are reading the Bible and, and making statements uh, to their followers because you know they are saying that this is what's in the Bible. See it, read it. Oh yeah, that's because people aren't re rightly dividing their word of truth, and they would understand. You know, uh, the devil quoted the Bible when he tempted Jesus. He said, "Yea, it have said." So it's not. It's not a. A, a new thing that wicked and evil people will quote the Bible and use that against people. See, the Bible is the power of God to um, uh, uh, to to us, and so it's the Word of God, and so we can miss anyone can misquote the Bible. That's why the Bible warns us of false prophets 
and false teachers and antichrists. And it tells us to test the spirit, whether it be of Christ. There were many false prophets in the day. And so that's why we need to study to show ourselves approved unto God, rightly dividing the word of truth. You can wrongly divide it. And that's why you don't trust man. It said, let God be true and every man a liar. So if we're not studious students of the word, we can be fooled. And we're not supposed to trust any man, not even a pastor or priest, whatever. We're supposed to let God be true. And how do you do that? Whatever the Bible says is true. And what well, I now, hold on a second, because one of my, um, I know how humans think. And humans wrote the passages that were accumulated into the Bible. They wrote it um, uh, under uh, inspiration from God, but humans wrote what has now come as the Bible. Well, okay. And yeah. we, when we write something or when we inter when we record something, we have to write through our what makes sense to us. And my belief is God doesn't make sense to us. But when we in uh, when we record it, when we write things down, we write things unless we're writing science fiction or something of that nature, we are writing things in a manner that we can uh, understand. Okay, look, look, look at what Peter says about this same conversation. This is in Second Peter verse 1, I mean chapter 1, um, and I'll start at verse 15. Okay, one second, let oh. me get my glasses back. <laughs> okay, no problem. Second Peter, first Peter. You said Second Peter, what? Second Peter, chapter one. Um, I'll start at thirteen. Okay. Okay. It says, Yea, I think it meet, as long as I am in this tabernacle, to stir you up by putting you in remembrance, knowing that surely I must put off this tabernacle, which is your body, even as our Lord Jesus Christ hath showed me. Moreover, I will endeavor that ye may be able, after my decrease, de decease, I'm sorry, to have these things always in remembrance. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power of the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but every eyewitness of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory, when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. This is when John the Baptist baptized him, and out of heaven God said, This is my Son. So that he's, he's, re he's reminding them. Okay. And this voice which came from heaven, oh, there you go, we heard him when, when we were with him in the holy mount. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, okay? Whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in dark place, until the day dawn and the day star rise in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of scripture, scripture is written, is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So Peter is making a claim here that just like you said, well, we know man can uh, write it. No, God is saying it's not of any private interpretation. No man did their own private thinking or interpretation, but yet, they were moved by the Holy Spirit and they spoke as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. 
So when when the prophets spoke or these holy men spoke and they wrote down these words, those were God's words, not their own private interpretation of God's words. And that's what the Bible claims. This is uh, speaking to prophecy and scripture, uh, and, and we're assuming that that means the, the Bible as it is in King James, King James Version. Well, yes. Well, yeah, because uh, the, the law, well, the, he's talking at right now because he had the law and the prophets. So Abraham was a prophet. Anyone that spoke God's word was a prophet. So all of the Moses spoke God's word. He was a prophet. So all of the, the writers of the Old Testament were prophets uh, and even the New Testament, you know, the the uh, disciples, they were prophets. They spoke God's word to the people. So I know they're called apostles, they're called prophets, they're called... All, so prophecy is the word of God through man. So so God would... Uh, so th he's talking about the Old Testament because at that time the New Testament wasn't complete. So he's saying that the written scripture of prophecy was is God's word and not man's word. Okay, so he's making that claim. So all of the written Old Testament from Genesis, I mean, yeah, from Genesis to uh, Malachi was all God's word, and he's making that claim there. Now let's turn to what Paul said in Timothy, Second Timothy, Second Timothy, I think it's two, Second Timothy two, chapter two. Well, yeah, 2.15, it says, Study to show thyself approve unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Um, so it's, it's 2 Timothy 3.16. That's what it is. It's 3. So I'll go to 2 Timothy 3.16. Or I'll start at 15. Are you there? Yes. Okay. At 15, it says... All right, uh, let me start. Let me start at 12. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall sh suffer persecution, but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. So that's what we're seeing today. They're deceiving people and they're also being deceived, the evil people. And they're going to wax worse and worse. That's why I say this world is going to get worse and we see it happening that way. But he's telling. Timothy, but continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures. Now this is this is after Christ has already died and resurrected. So if he has the holy scriptures in his possession as a child, that doesn't mean the original writings of Moses, because that's over 2,000, almost 3,000 years from when Moses wrote those books. See, God not only preserved, uh, 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 authored his word, but he preserved his word. So, yes, the copies do are God's word. God promised to preserve his word, not his original books. All right. So and it says that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture, you can't go, you can't go um, any, you know, further than that. It says all, all means all, and that's all means. All scripture is given by inspiration. Is is a present tense word. Not was given, it currently still is. God is still inspiring his word says all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine for reproof for correction for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect thoroughly furnished unto all good works that's how the man of God is perfect is when they follow all of God's word because God is inspiring it daily so every time we read his word, he's inspiring it and it talks to the heart. It talks to the soul. And this is God's word. Does that make sense so far for what the Bible is claiming of itself? Okay. All right. 
Yeah, so what that... that um, you know, that, thank you for that, because that um, clarifies that uh, the prophecies were not of human understanding. Uh, I know that when I've read through um, the Gospels and uh, Jesus was would, would uh, refer back to Isaiah and certain other um, uh, prophecies that had been stated, and and he and, and then the book actually says the Bible actually says, well, this is a um, uh, a revelation of that prophecy that was stated, and then it'll go back and refer to the prophecy. Um, the I need to understand more around, um, you know, I guess, is King James, was King James um, inspired to commission the writing of the, the Bible or the uh, accumulation of the Bible and, and what was determined, who determined what would be included in the King James Version versus not be included and where um, where it would be included and, and named, uh, the books of the Bible being named and that type of thing. Okay, and, and I'll answer those questions. I just want to also point out here, it says that the man of God may be perfectly thoroughly furnished unto all good works. See, the Bible was not written for the lost person, for the sinner. The, the Bible was written for the man of God. See, God gave his word to his believers, his people. If you don't believe in the Bible, the Bible is not for you. See, that's where the world gets it wrong. He thinks that the, that the Bible is for everyone. No, God is specific to just the man of God. And then also, and so that's why it's written in a way that people that aren't spiritually alive cannot understand it. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, it speaks exactly to that. It says in 13, 2 verse 13, it says now, I mean 12, it says now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God. See, once you're saved, you receive the spirit of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. See, when, you're, when you believe God, God gives you the knowledge. He gives it through his spirit, the Holy Spirit. And it says, it's like a light switch. Exactly. Exactly. He didn't say exactly, Kale. <laughs> huh? Well, I mean, well, he didn't say exactly. I mean, he, he, when you know something, it's like a light switch. It's, it goes from not knowing to knowing. I mean, I'm not. You mentioned light switch, but I'm just saying that it's it's that drastic from not knowledge to knowledge. See, that's what it's saying. It says, "Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit." which is of God that we may, might know, not guess, not hope, but know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man, which is the lost, unsaved person, but the natural man receiveth not these things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them. See, they cannot know. That's why that light switch is off. So if you want to use a light switch, that's a good analogy, because they are spiritually discerned. They can't know the Bible because they are spiritually discerned. But he is he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. See, when Christ is in you, now you have his mind, and you can understand his word. Now, to answer your question about King James, once you are a believer, and you really believe the Bible, now you take every word literally, and you try the word by the word. You compare scripture with scripture. And the scripture tells us in First uh, Peter, um, not first, is it First Peter? Uh, yeah, First Peter two. We'll turn back to that. First Peter two. Uh, my 
that thing is going on. First Peter 2, 17, uh, 13. It tells us as Christians, we are to submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. So you submit your to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, not for your own sake or not for the government's sake, for the Lord's sake. So if the Lord has made an ordinance of man, then we're supposed to submit to it. Do you know that the King James Bible was the is the is the only ordained authorized Bible to ever be written from a king? That's the ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. He did it so that common man can have the Bible in the English language. All right. So it says, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king, and it's a small k, as supreme, or unto governors, as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers. And for the praise of them that do well. For so is the will of God. This is God's will. That we, with well doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. As free and not using your liberty for a cloak of ma maliciousness. But as the servants of God. Honor all men. Love the bro brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the king. And that K is a small K. So we're not talking about Jesus as the king. We're talking about the kings that God has ordained. King David. King so uh, Solomon. King James. Honor the king. Honor the king's ordinance. For the Lord's sake. So I have a biblical right to honor any ordained Bible of God. And the King James Bible is the only Bible that's ordained from a king for God, for the Lord's sake. So I have a scriptural reason why I believe the King James Bible is God's words, let alone the fact that there is no errors in the King James Bible. If, if there are, please point them out to me. Let alone the fact it's the most popular Bible ever written year after year. It's the number one bestseller. Let alone the fact that it's how we get saved. That's how we find the words of Jesus Christ that gives us the gospel message that we can be saved. But just the mere fact that it tells me to, to honor the king and to submit myself to every ordinance of man's for the Lord's sake, I'm going to do that. So, yes, we can always speculate and not know for sure that, hey, man back there must have messed it up. But I believe that God is a God of his word and God can preserve his word even through men. Just like he preserved his word through stuttering Moses, stutter, stutter, stuttering Moses. Moses wrote the first four books of the Bible. And remember, as the prophet spoke, it didn't say right. <laughs> as they spoke, the Holy Spirit guided them. All right. So. I, I, I just believe that God is a God of miracles and God can make stuff happen regardless of who he's using. He doesn't use perfect men. Moses killed people. David ki uh, cheated on his wife and, and killed uh, killed uh, Bash uh, Bathsheba's husband. Uh, so, you know, we can go down the list. Paul killed Christians. Uh, you know, we can go down the list. God doesn't work with perfect men because there was only one perfect man or actually two, Jesus and Melchizedek. So we can talk about that. Huh? Who was the second one? Melchizedek. King Melchizedek. That was God in the flesh. We can look at that in Hebrews. Want to look that up? That's a new one on me. I didn't know that. Mel yep. uh, Hebrews, what is this? Uh, Hebrews, I think it's seven. Let me go to it. Yeah, and that's what I try to tell people. When you read the Bible, you realize that Jesus was not the only time that God came in the flesh. Remember, Jacob wrestled against God and he called that person a man. That was God that he was wrestling when God came into the shape of a man and Jacob wrestled him. And the only way that Jacob won, he wrestled him all night. The only way that he won is he hit him in the hollow of his thigh <laughs> and, and wounded him. But and Jacob still wouldn't let go until God until God blessed him. 
and that's why God blessed him and changed his name to Israel. But uh, so God has appeared in the flesh many times. But the reason it makes Jesus so unique is he's the only begotten. Begotten means you come from God and he came out. He came through a virgin, Mary. So that was the only time that God has ever come through a virgin and started and grew up as a child into a man. The other times he just appeared as a grown man. He never grew up as a child. So that's why Jesus is so unique. So he did the whole life cycle of a man until death. So he he's a, he's 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 this perfect sacrifice for man because he came through the passage of man through 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 a woman. He lived a life that and he never sinned. He died on the cross. He died like a man would die physically. He shed his blood, which the life of the flesh is in the blood. So his shed blood is the life that we need so that we can live. So he had to shed his blood because the life was in his blood. And that life is what pays for our sins. His life is good enough to pay for all of our lives. So that shed blood paid for our sins. But then he didn't stay dead. He physically, spiritually arose from the grave. So he walked around. He showed his handprints to Thomas, who did not believe until he touched his handprints. He he walked and, and over 500 people witnessed him alive. And then he rose to heaven. So he's the perfect example of how we can go to heaven only through believing on his work on the cross and his life and his name. Jesus is our only way to heaven because he did it. And now he has the keys to life and death. Does that make sense? But let's look at Melchizedek in, in Hebrews 7. I think he starts off in 6. Yeah, we'll start off in, in Hebrews chapter 6. At the near the bottom, it says, uh, 16, for men were, uh, men verily swear by the greater and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife wherein god willing willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutable the immutability of his counsel confirmed it by an oath that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for god to lie god cannot lie so there's things that god cannot do he cannot lie so when when it's written on, on in his book God is bound by that word because he cannot lie. So that's another reason why it's a legal binding document for God and for us. That's another reason why the King James Bible is so important. We have his word. All right. It says it is impossible for God to lie. We might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon uh, the hope set before us which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the, ve the veil, whether the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus made an high priest forever the order of Melchizedek, or some people say Melchizedek. All right, verse, uh, chapter 7, verse 1. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the most high God. So he was not only a king, he was a priest. That's I think that was the first time that's ever and last time that's ever happened. A king and a priest. King David was a king. He wasn't a priest. King Solomon was a king. He wasn't a priest. There was no kings and priests. Melchizedek was the only one who met Abraham returning from the slaughters of the kings and blessed him. To whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace. Who's the king of kings and lord of lords, and who's the king of peace? Jesus is. All right. Without father, without mother, without descendant, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually now who in the world could that be let's read that again it says without father so he wasn't born of a father he was without mother he wasn't born of a mother without descendants he didn't have any children or descent 
I'm sorry. Having neither beginning of days, so he didn't have a beginning, nor end of life. He doesn't have an ending. Who is that? God that doesn't have a beginning. God is eternal. God is the only one that's eternal. But made like unto the Son of God. <laughs> so he was made like the Son of God. So God put him, God made himself flesh, and he looked like and act like and was like the Son of God, who is Jesus Christ. Abide of a priest continually. Now consider how great this man was, and it calls him a man, unto whom even the part um, uh, patriarch Abraham gave the tenth of the spoils. And verily they that are the sons of Levi, who receive the office of the priesthood, have a commandment to the tithes of the people according to the law, that is, of the brethren, though they came out of the loins of Abraham. So it's connecting Abraham's tithe to the Levit Levitical priesthood tithe, and that's how Jesus is a priest under the order of Melchizedek. And so Jesus, God had to, there's no priesthood that, that of, of man that can be holy enough to, to make Jesus a priest. God had to make Jesus a priest. <laughs> so God is saying, look, and, and, and when, and when, and when uh, God made a, 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 a um, you know, gave his word to Abraham, what did he also do? He said, I swear upon myself because there's nothing else to swear upon. So God, <laughs> God is the beginning and the ending. He, 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 he authored it and he confirmed it. The priesthood, the blessing, everything. So God made a way out of no way. And Melchizedek was God in the flesh, making Jesus a priest. Very interesting. Yeah, you can also read back in uh, Genesis, uh, I think it was 11, when, when, Melchizedek, when, when Melchizedek was first uh, spoken of, or is it 13? Let me see. That's when Abraham gave a 10% of the spoils of war. See, a lot of pastors also like to say, well, see, Abraham, before the law, uh, gave a tithe. No, he didn't give a tithe of his money. He gave a tithe of what he won in war. He didn't give a tithe of his of, of his regular day-to-day day -day earnings, you know, or, or what he already had. And he didn't give it to a church. He gave it to God. Melchizedek was God in the flesh. And he did that out of, uh, out of his own the, choosing. Uh, to the, so the priests are descendants of Levi. Exactly. Exactly. The, Le the Levitical tribe w was um, the, the, the sons of Levi were the ones that were promised the tithe. They were promised the 10% of not just the tithe wasn't money. It was crops of the land. They weren't promised the land. They were promised the 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 tie from the land which is why they weren't given land exactly uh, and joshua but eventually i saw i think uh in this latest joshua that we were reading was uh 20 i think it was 21 or so the uh the descendants of levi went over and said hey should we get something <laughs> and then even after three or four times in Joshua, the Levi, the Levites, it stated the Levites didn't get land because they... They weren't promised uh, land. They got their, uh, their uh, allotment from God himself. Exactly. The priesthood and, and the tithe. Yep. Very interesting. Yep. Well, I'm going to check out this McKissadak. Yeah, well... But there's some people to call him but but uh but, but Mel what's it why did you just make me mess up with Melchizedek 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 let me see where the next uh reference of him is in the Bible it's in Genesis he's he's only in those two two locations let me pull it up real quick he's in Genesis fourteen Genesis yeah. Because remember, they were talking about Abraham. Genesis chapter 14. He's called Melchizedek, king of Salem. Oh, I guess he's also in Psalms 110. So it all depends on how they spell the name. Yeah, he Genesis 14, 18. Now, I read Genesis, and I uh, didn't... Uh... 
And Melchizedek, king of Satan, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. See, and that's another thing. See, in the Genesis, okay, all right, so yeah, it doesn't explain. See, that's that's why you have to read the whole scripture and compare scripture to scripture because there it doesn't explain who he is. It just announces, it just announces him. So yeah. in, in Hebrews, because remember, Hebrews is written to the Hebrews. And so it's explaining to the Hebrews who this priest is and why he's so important. A lot of times Old Testament is not fully explained until you read the New Testament. And a lot of times in the New Testament, God references the Old Testament. So you won't understand it until you go back into the Old Testament and read what he's saying. And then it makes more sense. See, so that's why you got to compare scripture with scripture. And that's why all of the canon of scripture has to be true. It's all married together. It has to be true. If one part of it is wrong, it's not God's word. God cannot lie. We just read that in Titus. And and let me just show you this one last thing. And I know we've been long, man. I, I, I appreciate these conversations. In Titus 1, it says... Yeah. One one, Paul, a servant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledging of the truth, which is after godliness and hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie says it again, promised before the world began. So God, pro God already knew everything is going to happen. He promised Jesus Christ before the world began, before he said, let there be. God already promised. It was already written down in heaven. See, that's what people don't understand. God is going to open up the books in heaven. The same words we have here on earth, God has them written in heaven. In Revelation uh, 22, he opens up the books. We're going to be judged by the books of the Bible. That's why it's so important that we know this Bible because we're going to be judged by it. And right here it says he promised before the world began. No one was there for him to promise. It was just God himself. God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the Trinity. And they wrote down their promise in heaven. So that's what people don't understand. All of this is controlled by God. God already knows what's going to happen. There's nothing that surprises God. He knows the beginning and the ending before he even started it. <laughs> It's, it's amazing. God is way beyond our comprehension. So I just bow to God. I just bow to his word. And I just, whatever he says, I believe it. Very good. Very good. Well, this has been helpful. I, um, I appreciate you uh, cutting time out for me uh, whenever I uh, reach out to you and request. And uh, it's always... Uh, helpful to hear your, um, not just your, uh, your thoughts, but to hear your knowledge and, uh, and the reference to what is in the Bible. So Amen. promise there'll be more. Amen. Man. Hey, I, I appreciate it. Let's end in a word of prayer, man. I, I thank you for this time. Heavenly Father, uh, it's, it's always an honor when we can look to your word and understand your word and seek your, seek your understanding. For our lives and what you what your will is for us in our lives lord and i just pray that we got something from your word i pray that we represented your word correctly if there's anything that was said that was incorrect I, I i pray that i stand corrected that any of us stand corrected by your word because your word is what guides us and directs us and lord it's just an honor that we can have your word where we can pick it up and read it we don't have to go through a priest to to tell us what you have for us we can just go any time of the day and look at your word and you have a word for us. And I thank you for that privilege and that honor. And I thank you for authorizing the King James to give that to us. I thank you for that, Lord. And I just thank you for this time that we can share. I pray that we can do more. I pray that you will bless us because of it. But more importantly, I pray that we can not only just keep this word within ourselves, but we'll share it with the world as you commanded us to do. Go out and preach your gospel to the world. So thank you for this time, Lord. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, amen. Anytime, Todd, man. It's a pleasure. I'm sorry. Uh, what, what was that? 
Oh, I said anytime, Todd, man. It's, it's totally a pleasure. So yeah, anytime, man. Let me know. We'll make we'll we'll make way. Let's do it. I enjoy this. Very good. I appreciate it, my brother. We'll see you uh, in an upcoming event. Yeah, definitely. All right. All right. Take God care. bless. Bye.